Well, I'll, just, I'll just start with some questions. We'll see where it goes. Why were you born in Lynchburg, Virginia? My mother uh, was from Lynchburg. She was originally from Gretna, which is a little town right south of Lynchburg. Mm -hmm. And she uh, was, uh, uh, father's name was Silas Watkins Lee. And he had been in the Civil War. And he had been uh, with Lee when he surrendered at Appomattox Schoolhouse. I see. And he walked home to Gretna. And so she, since I was the first child born, uh, she went back to her family doctor. And I got a, uh, found in some of the things I had, a, a letter from that family doctor, Dr. Ramsey, that delivered me. So she stayed up there a month and then brought me back to Georgia, and I've been in Georgia pretty well ever since. So she went up there? To have, have me. I see, been with her family, okay. You spent three years at the Citadel, and that's... Two years. That's in uh, Savannah? No, it's in Charleston, Charleston. Charleston, South Carolina. Okay. Why the Citadel? Did you get well, some military... Uh, 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 my father uh, liked the uh, uh, military training, and I had heard of the Citadel, and he had heard of the Citadel, and uh, we had a turpentine place in South Carolina at that time, and I went up there and not knowing a single solitary person in all of that part of South Carolina. And you know, our background of our family was out from Charleston at Walterboro. And so he encouraged me to go to the Citadel. So I went there two years and then transferred to the University of Georgia. Studied forestry. And that's another story if you want me to tell you about yes, that. We, uh, we had a neighbor who owned a, a some forest land in the southern part of South Carolina called Palmetto Bluff that's now owned by Union Camp Corporation. And we uh, were in the turpentine business up there because he wanted somebody to turpentine that knew what they were doing. And I had spent time up there in the summertime and I'd spent time up there in the wintertime and it was a great pleasure. I killed my first deer when I was 12 years old up there. And uh, my father and Mr. Vaughn and some of the other people around Valdosta would have uh, the senators. They had Senator Cotton Ed Smith from South Carolina. They had Senator Walter George. They'd have Senator Russell. They'd have some of the congressmen up there, and they would entertain them on deer hunts. And uh, while I was up there, Senator George talked to me, and he was telling me what all Roosevelt was uh, doing about... Uh, conservation and all of that and of course my my background had been in the turpentine business and the timber business and he had a son who was uh, attending the University of Georgia School of Forestry at that time and uh, his son later went to Walf from, from, from there uh, and got killed uh, but uh, so I, I uh, that, that encouraged me and my father encouraged me and that's what I wanted to do anyway and I sort of found myself when I got to the University of Georgia and I love forestry and I, I guess that's one of the great blessings of my life that I studied at uh, forestry at that time because I was the first boy from Lowndes County that I know anything about uh, that went, went off to school to study forestry. Well, I asked John yesterday if there was a, your father's plan that he would study forestry and he would study law and then the two of you together would be well groomed to run a business. Is that no, I don't think he really had that. He wanted us to amount to something. He wanted us to work hard, and his motto was when you get out, get knocked down, get up. And I think really that uh, I, I was leaning to studying law, even going to the Citadel. I, I had the books and all of that, and uh, I guess we were following our father that way. Uh, but, but my idea all the time was, uh, was not... Uh, to be as technical as a, a professional person like that would more be like an operator in, on forest land and turpentine business. What were the issues when you were in forestry school? The New Deal obviously was, was an issue for everyone, but uh, use of fire, well, what were the controversies then? Or were well, the controversies? well, really, uh, uh, we we had the beginning of a forestry school at the University of Georgia. Uh, we didn't have really uh, very good facilities. A lot of our books were translated from the from from German, and we studied uh, forestry that really didn't pertain to what we've been doing in in the South uh, over these years. 
But I remember that the main issue that people talked about more and more about those times, at uh, those times, those kind of times, was the fact that the Forest Service was a leader in trying to have forest regulation. Right. And uh, that was the main topic right there. Of course, uh, our problem was that we didn't have fire protection, uh, we didn't have the markets, we didn't know about a lot of these things that we know about now, and uh, nobody had the money to practice forestry. Most of the books that I studied and forest finance and all, I didn't go up to 8%, and most of them are talking about trying to uh, uh, practice forestry and have a return of 3 or 4% on your investment. And uh, but I I I I would say that forest regulation and fire protection, markets, and the lack of money were the main points. And when I was in forest school, when you came home, how did your father react to his uh, your son with all these newfangled ideas? Uh, well, he uh, he uh, he understood that, and he was a uh, he was a great believer, and not. Uh, he used to quote for who he said was uh, Benjamin Franklin, said, be not the first to try the new, nor the last to throw the old aside. And he, he was progressive, and he was, pro he was uh, to some extent. And I remember very well that, uh, of course, I guess when you, anybody gets out of school, they think they know uh, uh, more answers than they do. And I was, uh, got us in the pulpwood business. And he questioned that uh, strongly because nearly about every turpentine producer, naval stores producer, uh, at that time questioned whether the pulp and paper bills were going to put them out of business because they're going to cut down the trees and they're going to utilize them all and there wouldn't be any turpentine, timber to turpentine. And uh, he, we, uh, we had a policy of being conservative, or he did, of uh, putting up one turpentine phase, not putting two to work the tree out, but putting one and let the tree rest a little bit, put another one there, and maybe then you'd have a vein you could put another one. Because really, all the income that he and most everybody else down in this section of uh, the country uh, came from neighbor stores. We, the uh, uh, saw logs didn't bring any money. I, I was cross ties to some extent, and uh, you didn't have any pulpwood market, so it was mostly from naval stores that people that got something to eat and got ahead a little bit and made a little bit of money. So I would go around, and a lot of these trees that have uh, two faces but room for another one, I would mark it with my gun and uh, uh, to be cut. And he would come by and he would say something to the producer. Uh, they says, well, now, I don't know about that. He says, uh, says uh, you better ask Harley how he went to forestry school and where I got the money to do that. And he says, we got the money out of naval stores, and I don't think we ought to cut any tree that we can put a turpentine cup on. So we had uh, we had uh, discussions like that, but uh, he uh, he was very tolerant of me, and he was in very encouraging, and he carried me in every situation that I could be so, uh, exposed to really. Now how old does a tree have to be before it's good for, for producing gum? Well we if it's if it's on good quality land and a good site I have seen them when they were 15 years old with a cup on them. But that's unusual. I'd say most of you are in uh, 18 or 20 and and we had a lot of producers. That's what broke most turpentine producers back in the 20s when when, when uh, polio resin or gum was bringing a good price, they would turpentine trees uh, seven inches in diameter or maybe less. And that was where the government stepped in and, and encouraged us under the Naval Stores Conservation Program not to turpentine anything less than nine inches DBH. Is that a federal program? That was a federal program. Naval Stores Conservation Program. They came in and paid the turpentine producers to take the cups off anything less than nine inches DBH. And uh, so uh, that en encouraged us. Uh, but uh, so we, we want to step above that, and we went uh, on some of our places and says 10 inches and up. Well, the yield was better, so you, you have a little advantage from the from your cost standpoint. Now, this is longleaf and slash pine, what? Longleaf and slash pine. And longleaf was it's hard to reproduce. Very hard to reproduce on most of our sites. Long is not good for... Your no, sir. 
blah blah that does not produce enough oleo resin. When I drove, and I was here before, I drove east from here over to the swamp, and I saw the trees that had their cuts on them, uh-huh. and somebody was getting gone. Were those long leaf or slash pine? They'd have to be long leaf or slash. You don't see in this area at all. Now, when you got over in Alabama, every now and then they would have a loblolly pine that they would call a rosemary pine that was a fast-growing, old-field loblolly pine, and they'd put a cup on it, but they wouldn't make much gum. You'd go broke doing that. And we didn't have them in Loblaw. In fact, while I was going to forestry school, I came home one uh, year, and of course, you know, we didn't have a lot of work for our certain time uh, laborers to do in the uh, uh, at certain times of the season. And he and the manager had them girdling Loblaw the pine because he wanted to get rid of them. They did not produce gum. And uh, now Loblaw the pine is the most important pine tree in Georgia. There's no doubt about that. Sure. Well, when did the big companies come that made lumber uh, just, or paper? When did trees become more valuable for lumber and paper other than gum? Yeah. Well, uh, the paper business started moving south about 1930 or 31. The first mill that I know anything about that that we could uh, do anything with was a was a international paper company. Southern Craft Division at Panama City, Florida. They started operating in 31 or 32. But that didn't amount to anything. They had all the wood they wanted right around the plant. So we couldn't ship to them then. So I guess that the first pulp wood, after Union Camp started, and they started up in 36, and then the mill that we got connected with more and more, a National Container Corporation, started up in 1938 in Jacksonville. Uh... So, so I would say that we became acquainted. I graduated from forestry school in 1937. So I, I was aware after I got out of school. In school, we were not really subjected to uh, much uh, timber cutting from a pulpwood standpoint or paper mill. But we started cutting, and I've been in the pulpwood business, and our company has been in the pulpwood business continuously every week since 1938. I believe that's a. Uh, a record with the most uh, of any company, and we've shipped to we've shipped to Savannah, we've shipped to Brunswick, we shipped to St. Mary's, we shipped to Jacksonville, and we shipped to Panama City. And I'll tell you later about where the mill how it, we 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 got the mill here in this county and all that. To be sure that I understand, when you get involved in pulpwood and you're also producing gum. Are these the same species, or you're going lob only pine for, for pulp and long leaf for gum? No. At that time, we did not pay any attention to our lob pine as such. We wanted to always have slash so we would have an uh, alternate source of income. And slash was easy to plant. Long leaf, we didn't know much about planting that. But we, could, we went out in the woods and dug up slash pine where it would come up uh, really thick in some low places and planted them. And we planted them further apart, and our purpose was to grow trees that we could uh, produce uh, gum from. And uh, but uh, so there were no nurseries yet. No, it, it, not then to speak of. And a little later on, they began to be more and more of the state in the 30s, late 30s. Uh, but we were we were we were still it was it was slash and long leaf and more slash than anything else because slash was so easy to to regenerate much easier than long leaf. All I, I took the forestry in, in 1950 studying forestry uh-huh. and all I remember long leaf was even then very difficult to uh-huh. regenerate. Well, we're liking it better and better, and we're doing more and more of it, and we have learned what not to do pretty well, and we've got some pretty good stands of long leaf that we planted now. And we like it because we can control birds so much quicker, you know. Yeah. I, I didn't know that you could grow along with successfully. Oh, yes, That's you so can think, now. Yeah. And uh, it's surprising, so. Well, let's, uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of companies in the family, and the, the names are, are confusing to me. But let's go back to the original uh, Naval Stores Company that your, your father started. And that still exists, right? But you don't do naval stores anymore. No, sir. We quit. This was the last. We sold out our, our, our naval stores plant uh, back uh, 15 years ago. We wound up. That was, it was a sad day. Who did you sell it to? 
sold it to the government of Honduras. And they came up here and took it apart and numbered every piece and shipped it down there and they said their purpose was to create employment. Their trees didn't run that good, but they took it and they put it up and the last account I heard it had been running now. What you, what, what's the status of it now? I don't know. I didn't know there was a market anywhere in the world for the old type naval stores. Well, that's right. Uh, uh, there, there, there wasn't much, but uh, they came up and wanted to buy the plant. If you, if people like me read about the history of forestry in the South, we read a lot about Charles Hurdy. Yes. The Hurdy Cup and the, all the way the naval stores, and then what he did in, in uh, newsprint. What did you think of Hurdy at the time? If well, look back and we can see he was important, but did yeah. you know that he was important when you were in school? Uh, well, I met Dr. Hurdy. I met him on, and was with him on several occasions, but I never shall forget the time that he came to Valdosta, and we had a meeting in the courtroom of the courthouse, the county courthouse. And he was talking about forestry, and he's talking about how it was going to grow, and the trees could be used for pulp and paper. And I guess we must have had 15 or 20 people up there. And he made the statement, and I will never forget it. He says, the great hindrance to growing trees in South Georgia and in this area is that the, the turpentine people who control burn their woods, I didn't say control, he said burn their woods every year. And we did <clears throat> back in those days because the turpentine operator had such an investment in those cups and gutters and nails and gum in the cup and those turpentine faces would readily burn. So we would call, uh, we would weed around the tree. Uh, they would use the word uh, wed. Uh, and you'd go about this far all the way around and then you would burn the woods and hoping those faces would not catch. And <clears throat> he said the greatest hindrance was wildfires and the turpentine <coughs> operators. But, so, but so, earlier he was very important to turpentine. Oh yes, because when he was at Georgia and all, he was the one that developed the Hurdy Cup, which was a clay cup. And uh, the, the, you know, the cup and the gutter system, metal uh, galvanized gutters, he was, uh, he was right in the forefront of that. And see, we could take those clay cups and we could make the highest grade of rosin, which always brought the most money. So we used more clay cups, which we call the Hurdy Cup. So the clay didn't contaminate the, the gutter. Right, right. Later on, somebody figured out that we could use glass even better, so we were, we jumped on that wagon and we uh, we ordered some. And I guess it's the first time that I remember that we had a had a freeze after a rain, and there's water in the bottom of them. Hot, they were sort of sort of so they could expand that way, but <clears throat> that water froze, and the next day it warmed up in the middle of the day, and then we had a hard freeze that next night and all those cups would burst all over the woods and we worried about that a long time but the glass company paid us back the cost of the cups and when we had to go and put the hurdy cups uh, down to it but the hurdy cup would break too but in the winter time we would turn it at an angle so that the water so instead of the cup hanging like that uh, perpendicular to the tree it would hang at an angle uh, you had a little nail you'd put under it, and then that way, if it froze, it would have plenty of open space that it could expand the water. What, what was the capacity of a, a, a pint or a uh, quart? Now, later on, we did have some cups. Uh, uh, have you, you've seen cups, haven't you? I mean, no, I never have. Oh, you have? I've seen pictures of cups. Well, let me see if I have got something. Good. Like All right. <clears throat> Look at your museum here, huh? Yeah, I got, uh, now these are some of the later cups, uh, a little bit dirty, now this is aluminum, this okay. is an old aluminum, and this is aluminum, and this is, a, this is what we started using later, and this is a plastic, but uh, I had some clay cups in, and, and John Jay's got some over there at his office, I don't see any in here now. But we've got some over here. Well, this is the cup that we put under there, and we put the gutters. Now, we used a galvanized cup, which was cheap. Now, how did this hang on the tree? Is the nail head goes under the rim? We put a 20-penny nail yeah. underneath the cup, just like this in a tree, yeah. and it would sit like that, and it would be tight up there next to that uh, galvanized gutter. 
it looks like to me it would fall over or something. No, if a bird landed on. No, if you put it, see, you got a, you got a, we call it an apron, and then you had a gutter to bring it down there. The gutter of tents. It's, it's a gutter. So you put it up there, that, and then it couldn't move. Yeah. yeah. Now we would fuss at our labor all the time to make sure that he put it up there in a fashion that that wouldn't happen. A lot of times now they'd be in a hurry and it would lean a little like that, and we'd have to go by and straighten them up or get on them or buy it up. Do something. Okay. I see here. Is this called a, a hack? What well, is that's that? a hack. Hack. Uh, the paper mill gave me that. Uh, they went down and bought the timber from the people who had a agreement from the Crown down in the Palm Islands. And they'd been try, uh, another company had tried to turpentine down there. And they found out that that timber uh, would grow to about 80 or 9 inches in diameter. And then it would really slow down and it would be hardwood. And they turpentine business, they just couldn't, it wouldn't run. You don't want hard, you want the sap part. Sure. Where you've got the cambium laying on it. And that was a hack that they found out. They, they fixed it up a little bit with this. They played chrome. Chrome there. Yeah. Well, here's on this calendar. Yeah, that's it. There's your apron. See your apron right here? Yeah. Now, we usually would put the apron and then uh, we might put a gutter right there so we wouldn't lose any around the corner. Now, that's exceptionally good. Let's see here. I see that's a virgin phase. First year. We call that virgin. And this right here is a, is a second year. I got a bunch of these. That's first year. That's later in the year. See, you put on. We did, put on one street. We put on thirty streets a year. Uh, did you? Yeah, fifty years ago, did you go that low in the tree? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, fifty years. Yes, sir. Because I've only seen the photographs. I've only yeah. seen them up, up yeah. waist high or something. Yeah, we, we we always went down as low as we could back then. Uh, now, uh, now see, this one right here was up a little bit, but that shouldn't have been that high. It should have been down low as we could. realized that people in the naval stores business saw people in the lumber business as kind of enemies in a way. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. They didn't, uh, they didn't uh, get along until they got ready to sell out. Now, a lot of them came, they got well that way. A lot of them were in debt and all, and they would turpentine a track, and then they uh, maybe the price of um, logs had moved up a little bit, and they sold out. And that was about the only way to really make much money out of the naval stores business. And that's what happened to a lot of them. In some of the material that you loaned me, either you or your father talked about the turpentine factories and how essential they were in the 30s and the 40s. I'm not sure when they stopped being important. Tell me what, how the turpentine factory business worked. Well, the factor started right back in the late, uh, I, I guess, uh, after the middle of the uh, 19th century, 1850s. And then it got more and more important. And the factors were really uh, financial people that would finance turpentine operators. See, in the wintertime, you didn't make any crude gum. You, that was expense. You did your winter work. You put up your cups and your gutters and you got ready and you had your labor and you had uh, uh, your commissaries and you, you furnished them everything. But uh, the factors you would borrow money from, and the factors then would turn around and come April, they'd want some of that money back. And they would put you on a, a basis that uh, you started paying it back then. And what they wanted to do was uh, you pay it back, borrow it in the wintertime, pay it back in the summertime, and you do that every year. They uh, charged a high rate of interest, kind of like a loan shark arrangements. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember that when I got in it, that we were paying 8% interest, and then they charged us 2.5% of all of our product that uh, we would ship our product to them. They would sell it. They would take what, what they could get for it, or what, what we thought they got for it, and then they deduct the 2.5%. Then they had the wholesale grocery houses, had one in Valdosta, that you got your groceries from and they made a profit on that and your gasoline for your trucks and your mule feed and 
everything that you bought pretty well they made a little profit on that so uh, they were it was a big business but it was easy credit hard to pay back but it helped a lot of people get started that didn't have any money and they would look over and see people who were uh, had the ability to produce gum and they would try to set them up in business and the secret was if you could handle the labor which most all turpentine labor was black labor if you could handle those and knew how to get the work out of them well then you could get along with the factors pretty good because you could you could operate were these factors also the local banker and who has capital well uh, they they would uh, they would be uh, they were well one one factor uh, got most of his money out of Chicago uh, uh, I remember Fentis uh, company uh, had consolidated naval stores company they were a factor turpentine and rolls and factors had a certain amount of capital themselves I think the most capital they ever had was five million dollars in sales and uh, then they would borrow money from the local banks and the bank would loan them money but uh, but uh, the banks just regular banks particularly any national bank they couldn't loan you money on your uh, uh, land uh, t uh, timberland because uh, that was uh, not a legally that was what you call wasteland they could loan you on your mule and your wagon or your supplies or, or your farmland but they couldn't loan it to you on your timberland because that was wasteland until the federal land bank stepped in and then they changed that and could get some money from that but so those companies those banks would loan money to the factors the factors in turn would loan loan money I see cotton fields here. There were cotton factories. Were they ever the same people? No. Uh, they, they, the exchange over in Savannah was called the, the Cotton and Naval Stores Exchange, where they would meet every day and set the price. But they were different, pretty well different companies, different people. I don't know of any turpentine factor that was suited with cotton. I had anything to do with cotton. If you had enough money of your own, would you make better profit selling your gum directly to the market? They had access, the factors had access to a larger market than you would probably. Particularly the export market. Yeah. And they would maneuver around all that. No, that was a... <coughs> that, that, <coughs> excuse me, that was difficult to do because the factors had those kind of things uh, sewed up. And they could... They could get uh, several thousand drums of rosin together, or they could they could furnish uh, more turpentine to somebody you know, and the people who were buying would deal with them rather than an individual operator. Now, we did have a few operators that did have some sort of contact with them, but not many, not many, until this thing changed around, and the United States Department of Agriculture and their research station at out from Lake City at Olusty develop the, uh, the process of, of, uh, of uh, <clears throat> cleaning your gum before you cooked it and you made a high grade rosin and all of that then we could you could you, you had a market you could sell your gum to so that was a great that was a great advance in the turpentine business <clears throat> so the factors were necessary evil but you just should not have them. and you couldn't hardly get out from under them and I'll tell you how we did uh, finally do it but, uh, but it was it was very difficult to get out from under them because the bank would not really talk to you about financing on naval school operations well this is a good time to explain or is that later in your well story? I can uh, uh, I want you to tell this the way you feel comfortable I don't know well I'll, I'll finish up with the naval stores and, I, and then I'll okay. tell you then how we had these other comments <clears throat> okay well, I don't know enough about naval stores to ask what more questions there are. So go ahead, and tell me. More well, about it was a, it was a it was a good business, and a lot of people who uh, uh, knew how to work the labor made money out of it. Uh, most of the money you'd have good years and you'd have bad years, and most of the some of the people I used to have a standard saying say that we had people here that buy the biggest car they could buy one year, and the next year they couldn't even buy a license plate for it. And that was the way it was ups and downs. And the market was uh, manipulated a good bit by the factors and the brokers and the M exporters. What, uh, what was the main 
outlet, a home building for painting. Well, how is it used? It well, affected the price of, of turpentine. See, out of uh, out of the crude gum, which is proper name is oleo resin, you broke it down into turpentine, gum turpentine, from the living tree and rosin. The rosin was a solid. Turpentine, of course, was a liquid. Rosin went into soaps. It went into varnishes. It went into many chemicals of all kinds. went into paper sizing, the lower grades of rosin did. And uh, uh, then the turpentine went in as a paint thinner. It went into a cleaner and went into all kinds of things, too. And it, then finally it was broken down into alpha and beta pinene that went into other chemical products. So it was a more or less a raw product for other chemical uses. Well, if housing starts are up or down, does that affect the turpentine business? No, but the general prosperity helped the turpentine business. I wouldn't say that we were dependent on housing stores like we are today in the lumber business and yes. such. Uh, I would say general prosperity. And then uh, a lot of the rosin and some of the turpentine was exported to England and to the Netherlands and all those countries over there. They used the rosin for paper size and soaps and varnishes. And it was a big export market. So World War II increased the domestic demand, but the overseas shipping. Uh, right. Uh, uh, it was uh, naval stores were very important in World War II, and um, we uh, we we got the clearance to build our plant in 1943. Here we had 25 or so uh, turpentine still scattered over the woods. And we, we did away with those and had this one plant here that made a better rosin, and better turpentine. And we had a, had a priority to get the stainless steel equipment and the brass and the loom. And we built that plant in uh, six months' time. And uh, it was, rosin was very much in demand in turpentine during the war. In fact, I would say that about uh, in 1941 and 42 were the first years that we had seen that were really profitable in the naval stores business since the 20s. But labor was becoming scarce too. Coming scarce. And it was very difficult to, to do that. And, and especially the, the, the plants, the, the trees that you were working further back in the woods. The labor wanted didn't mind being close to town and you haul them out a certain distance and all. But it was a way of life for a lot of the black labor that really did it. And, and we, 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 it was critical, but we got by. Uh, all of our equipment was critical. Uh, we used mules to bring in gum from the woods that uh, we had been uh, a truck before that we'd use them. Because the gas and tire shortage. Gas and tires, and we had a full mule team that were down in the woods as you went down toward Fargo there that would go out 10 miles and they would make two or three trips a day to bring in uh, six barrels of gum. A barrel of gum weighing about 500 pounds. So uh, it was uh, it was important. Uh, and then see the American Turpentine Farmers Association, which I'm sure my brother John talked to you about, that my father. No, we didn't talk about this. I didn't talk to you about them. Well, it was formed in 1936 because uh, all the turpentine operators were pretty well broke, but the thing that really broke them was the fluctuation of the price manipulated by the factors and the brokers and the exporters. And so you would start off the year and you'd have your expense at this level and the price might go up a little bit but then it might come right back down before the end of the year and that's when where they would make their contracts and make money on it. And uh, so my father uh, had uh, really organized the American Turpentine Farmers Association. It was organized in 1936. And the whole main purpose was to stabilize the market and <clears throat> not to get it up this high of a certain level, but to have it at a fair price. And then when you got these periods where nobody wanted to buy, then the Commodity Credit Corporation would step in and loan the association the money to take that and put it uh, and hold it. And so it was a great blessing. Uh, that it was formed when it did because we had some of that rosin when the wall started and that's what uh, carried us over. So is this part of the uh, NRA Blue Eagle price uh, regulation of the New Deal? Or right. That was, a, that was a part of that and a part of a commodity credit coverage. And by the way, I, 
I don't think the Commodity Credit Corporation ever lost any money on, on uh, loaning money on Rawls and Turpentine because they, they made a level there. <clears throat> and then during a period, like during the war and other times, they would uh, sell it out at a profit and we got uh, we would get uh, extra bonus from them when they'd sell some of it. So this government agency became a factor in a sense. Absolutely. They didn't furnish you, all they, they furnished you a price on the product that you produced nothing for no other purpose and then you had the naval stores conservation program which was uh, developed or promulgated or whatever you say there for that about the same time and paid you if you quit turpentine in those small producers they were talking about more conservation growing more trees getting trees bigger for for pulpwood lumber anything that could be used for so those two things uh, uh, helped us considerably but uh, but uh, ter- uh, the turpentine business was a way of life. Just about every location that you went through going from here to Fargo or going from here to Savannah or going to here to Jacksonville or anywhere around here was pretty well started by somebody in the turpentine business. You can just name them uh, as you go down the road. There used to be a turpentine still there. They turpentine so long and then they sold the timber or the, some company bought the land and they sawed logs out of it, and then pulp and paper company stepped in. The naval source industry migrated around from North Carolina into Georgia. And then went on to Texas. And then it came back. But the original growth timber did start in Virginia and North Carolina and came right on around. And uh, then after that was uh, a turpentine route and sawmill route, then it started back, and it never did really build up that much in Texas anymore, or Louisiana. But it did a little in Mississippi, did some in Alabama, but not as much as it did Georgia, South Georgia, and North Florida. In South Carolina, uh, a little, a little came back uh, better. Well, the, the federal government is a mixed blessing, though. It, it also deals with wages, but it as a price support system, so I guess you have to take the good with the bad. Right, right. But I would say that the, the program was handled, and I don't remember any uh, scandal about it at all, uh, at all. And they uh, they handled it with uh, with uh, it less expensive than be handled any other way. And I think it added stability. And it helped us get started on growing more trees and, and practicing forestry and conservation. So I would say that's one program that I, I just couldn't criticize. In the 1930s, when a, when a tree has given up all the gum it had, can, I don't know how many scars you can cut you can put in, were they then cut for lumber? Well, they, 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 there was a semblance of cut for lumber. We had, in those days, in our, our whole area around here, what we call pecker wood mills, or, or push hard mills, or coffee pot mills, and they would go around, and sometimes that turpentine face would be higher than the ceiling. And you'd have to cut that off, because that would have wormholes in it, or it might have something else wrong, or burned. And then you would, uh, uh, the, my first experience of doing it actually myself was, we'd cut the tree down, and if we had 50% of that tree that we could carry the sawmill, that we were doing good. We'd leave that cat face there, we'd leave the top there, then we'd carry that part in the middle there, which the trees wasn't that tall. When we got it to the sawmill, I would say that our slab pit, our sawdust pit, was the biggest thing that we had. We'd have to burn those seven days a week to have room to put them in the, on Monday. And uh, I'd say 50% of that wood was usable. So I'm trying to understand naval store silviculture. Yeah. Uh, how, the rotation, how you deal with the new trees coming off. What kind of management plan you would have in the long term for naval stores? Well, now you know uh, we call that a certain time rotation, and you know it's uh, it's got some bad points about it, but it had a lot of good points about it, and it it attributed to the fact that we grew a lot of trees down there. What we did was do it on the diameter limit. And we would take <clears throat> and say, well, at, uh, at 9 inches or 10 inches DBH, we'd put a cup on. And then after we worked it and had two faces on it, we'd go through there and cut out those turpentine faces. 
and those trees that were growing in between that would come on in there we'd let it rest a few years we'd come back in there and do the same thing it was a it was what you would call your silver culture practice was a turpentine rotation because that's where the money was see we would work out a, a, a lease would sell for about 10 cents per face per year and we had an average of uh, <clears throat> Oh, I, I'd say a, a lot of acres uh, are taking the whole average. Uh, we'd have maybe 20, 20 uh, faces to the acre. So you're talking about $2 to the acre. Well, that was unheard of. Your taxes wouldn't be about 10 cents an acre then. And then you would you'd sell it for whatever you could get. But there wasn't much of a market for that lumber. When, we, uh, when, when, when I started out and trying to get rid of some of those trees, and I have great respect for anybody in the forest business that was in the neighbor store's business of what they were going to do with those worked out trees. But uh, <clears throat> when uh, we would, uh, uh, we just didn't have a market for it. But we'd have these uh, mills in the woods. <coughs> Excuse me. Because we didn't, uh, we didn't have these debarkers. We didn't know what that was until 19... 19- 52, I think, is the right date for that, but in our area. And we put our debarker in in 1957 and started operating in 58. But uh, we had these little mills that we would saw lumber, and you know that was always miscut. It'd be a two by four, and I would be four inches at one end and two at the other end when you wanted it to. And uh, uh, so that was, a, that was a rotation that we had back in the early days. I would say in the late 30s, and I've sold uh, I've sold some of those logs that cut down dull scale for two dollars and a half a thousand for stumpage, and uh, <clears throat> but that was the silver culture practice that we knew when I got out of forestry school and came back in. Now I've been working in the woods every summer before that in the naval stores in there, but after the training in the forestry school. We came back and we turpentined a little bit different. We tried to get a bigger tree and better conservation practices, but we would cut out the trees that were big enough. But but the thinning, we didn't. We only way we could thin was the dead expense. I remember down on Superior Pine Products Company, which you rode through Drum Hill Fargo, that they would pay us and our labor if we didn't have anything for us to do uh, uh, per day to take those people and let them go and use their judgment with a with a with a with a axe that was sort of like a, a bush axe uh, that we cut down the little saplings and try to thin them because a lot of those acres would come up with two thousand to the acre sure and we would try to thin enough of them where they where they'd come through to help them you know to get started a little bit better but that's all we had no market no market for that. <clears throat> After the war, when uh, John Nose came back, were you in the service? I can, no. I can I'll tell you what happened. Uh, I, uh, I went to the University of Georgia, and I had an appendix operation while I was at the University of Georgia. And uh, some way or another happened that they left a little leakage, and I had a tumor growth that came on my intestines right at the location of where they cut my appendix out. And I had quite a time. In fact, it was a very uh, serious operation. And they had to cut out uh, part of my intestines and bring them back together. And uh, when they classified me uh, for well, nice. although I had been in the military in ROTC at the University of Georgia, I was in the cavalry there and I've uh, been uh, military at Citadel. So I did not go, and my two brothers did go. Well, after the war, John was telling me yesterday how he started consolidating all of the different pieces into a single company, and you're looking to the future. But at the same time, they're starting to make naval stores as a paper product, by by product. That's right. Did you see then that at some point it was going to put you out of business? Well, we didn't see it at first because everybody would tell us, chemists and all, said that, well, their sulfate turpentine just would not take the place of gum turpentine. They didn't smell alike. They didn't look alike. They didn't necessarily have all the same properties. And we thought that we had a superior product. So at first, we wasn't worried about that too much. But then all of us that was in the, uh, closer to the pump and paper mills 
soon realized that they had the money, they had the chemists, they had the people, and that was going to come about. And so it really has. They made the sulfate turpentine and tall oil rosin. Can, can you tell the difference today? I don't grapes. think so. I think they can make it any grade. See, we put great stock in spending money to make a light grade of rosin. You've seen how the great road. Uh, uh, no, no. I've heard about it. I haven't seen it. Well, I kept one set of samples. I just keep these from memory, and I think I have to put a $100 deposit in. And this is the uh, way we graded rows. This being the highest grade right here. This okay. right here is X. And then WW is water white. WG is Wendy glass. Uh, WG, uh, Nancy, Mary, Kate. Isaac, Harry, George, Frank, Edward, and Dolly. <laughs> and uh, uh, so... Uh, so you hold this up next to the cup? Or, or, or you cut a sample out of it. You cut, put, get a sample of every barrel. And then the inspector would come around and hold it up there and match the color. I see. And that's the way you graded rolls. And they say these colors came about by somebody way back in 1800 matching these colors with the color of their labor. You know, a uh, lot of a lot of blacks were I see. nearly white. Some okay. of them were black to dark, and that's the way these colors came about. But this was uh, this was uh, uh, the way this bringing the most money. So because the paper, of mill, preference. the paper mill couldn't make that grade to begin with. I see. But then they went to work, and they they can. My understanding. Well, Sean has a little bottle of gum on his desk. Yeah. Turpentine. Turpentine. And he said the only thing he ever used for it, he cut himself, he put yeah. it on the cut. I've never heard of it. Oh, yeah, my father thought that was the finest thing. In fact, if he started getting a cold and had a sore throat, he'd take a spoon, a teaspoon of sugar and put about two or three drops of turpentine on it. And he said he just had great belief that that would cure that cough for medicinal purposes. And um, we we got into turpentine. You see all those cans up there, and bottles. We we yes. we produced it, and and we shipped it all over the eastern part of the United States. I was trying to, I was trying all the time to get out of the commodity deal and get into a product every way that we could, and that was one uh, attempt. Well, I remember when oil-based paint was the only paint you could buy. Mm -hmm. You always thinned it with turpentine. Right. That's all I ever knew turpentine was used for was yeah. paint thinning. But it was a great use at one time. Now they've got these substitutes. That's right. Yeah, latex and yeah. whatnot. And see, most of the turpentine when I was coming along, we wasn't getting but twenty and twenty-five cents a gallon for it. Now, a gallon of turpentine is on up to eight or ten dollars. But yeah, although it was a way of life, I was black people around here. I don't know how they would have made a living, but they they would work, and we'd do it on the piecework rates, and uh, they would. They would go out in the morning. They would carry a little old feist dog with them. They would have a bucket that they'd put the what, food. What, what, what they carry with them? Feist dog, any kind of little old dog. And if a possum started out, okay. a rabbit, okay. they would catch that rabbit and put him in a in a bag and carry him home and eat him that night or something, you know. And but then in the middle of the day, if it got hot and they wanted to take a nap, they'd take a nap. Then they work later on in the afternoon. But it was a way of life that those people uh, enjoyed, and, and they made a living. There wasn't any, wasn't any welfare. I would have thought that the, uh, with the increase in paper production, that there'd be so much turpentine on the market now you could buy it for a nickel a barrel. But yeah, not true. but they're, they're breaking it down to more and more uh, chemical uses. I see. Was, is it more to talk about the American Turpentine Association that was formed uh, to help stabilize the market? Yes, sir. But it must have been involved in all industry concerns, whatever they might be. But well, it never did get that far in the lumber business. Uh, it might have been temporarily. We had price, uh, you know, we had uh, price control during the war on lumber and things like that, but it never did get that way with other products out of the forest that I know about. It was just uh, gum nails. We classed ourselves as uh, as the naval stores farmers, and uh, that's the way we uh, we got classified, and uh, that uh, that exempted us from some some ways, you know. Uh, and uh, tree 
three farmers. And, uh, but, the, uh, but the program really helped and stabilized neighbor stores. Was it after the war that you got really involved in lumber and posts and so forth? Well, no, I'll tell you, we, uh, well, I guess you could say that, but uh, we, we had always uh, been in the uh, lumber business. In fact, I, I, I saw a, a report here where my, father, my grandfather had shipped in 1908 uh, 14 by 14 in a car to Jacksonville from a place down below Fargo at Council. So we had been off and on, and we'd had that track, and we had uh, dealt with uh, these peckerwood mills, and that's about all we had around here. All the bigger mills were out around here. They they couldn't bring these smaller logs into the mill and then make their slab piles and sawdust and bark piles. They didn't have any market for any of that. And we, uh, we would use uh, those uh, little mills and uh, I would sell that lumber, and then later on, I brought, I brought them into the plant here and had a planer mill, and then we would separate it. We had a sorter, and we would separate uh, what we would make, mostly dimension, some boards, but mostly dimension. And uh, we made good quality because these turpentine trees, you know, you'd slow the growth down by turpentine, and your grain would be uh, dense most all the time. And... Uh, it was a uh, good quality, no size to it to speak of. Uh, so then, after we would address that and ship it, and, and, and just one thing led to another, until the development of the debarker, and then we put that in and put in a bigger mill, and now we bring our logs in and we go out uh, nearly about a hundred miles from Valdosta and bring it in logs. Certainly, seventy-five is no problem. And we got good uh, road system here. And uh, we bring them in, and now we 30% uh, of our sales from our lumber operation are byproducts that we used to burn and hire people to, to uh, burn them during the night and uh, during the weekend. What affects the market for posts and piling? Just the overall economy? The overall economy is higher, but the, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, pole business utilities, telephone and uh, electricity. I've been fairly, fairly steady, but I'd say it slows down in periods when housing stocks are slow down because they, they, use, they use a good many in the distribution of poles. We are, we are not producing the bigger poles that the utilities did use. They're using now concrete and, and uh, metal and other things, uh, but our, our distribution poles are uh, to, to out to the individual houses and places like that. It's been fairly steady. But I would say, uh, depending on the price of cattle, it affects your fence post business considerably. Uh, and so the market is really up and down. And it's not very uh, stable, but we've, uh, we've uh, been in it a long time, and we've got a, we, uh, we have a good marketing set up. Uh, uh, we started off where we were doing business with brokers and uh, things like other setups that we discontinued because uh, 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 we wanted to get closer to the market. How far do you ship most of your stuff? Uh, I would say most of our stuff is uh, uh, Florida is a great market. You know, they say that Florida uh, uh, is a user and not a producer. And uh, uh, being in Georgia, we're sitting right here on top of the Florida market, and we can we can produce here in Valdosta, and we can leave here early in the morning and be in any part of Florida that day. And that's working out well with us. I would say that our, uh, our general, our biggest market, uh, we have a plant in Tennessee that goes into Ohio and Indiana and Illinois and West Virginia and up that area. But here in Valdosta, about 500 miles in pretty well every direction. I'd say generally our biggest market is south of us. We are, Florida has, uh, has uh, not been a producer of lumber. It's been dropping off all the time. Uh, poles the same way. Uh, so uh, uh, Florida is becoming more of a bigger state. They're not really encouraging the industry either. And so I think that uh, uh, our market is, is developing more and more south of us. But, but generally 500 miles, take care of it. <clears throat>
Why we have shipped to Maine, and we're doing some export business. Uh, Jacksonville, where do you ship? Well, we do out of Fernandina. We have out of Jacksonville. We do a little out of Brunswick. We do some out of Mobile. We do some out of Savannah. Are you still? Is the company still involved in land acquisition? Well, <clears throat> yes, sir. We do not say no. We uh, we buy from time to time, and we're not buying as uh, uh, many tracks now as we have in the past. But it's mostly filling out where we have a, a track that comes on the market that's contiguous to what we have, and we uh, we still look at it and buy. But I would say that uh, where we used to buy eight and ten thousand acres a year, we're down now to fifteen hundred, two thousand acres ordinarily. Do you sell any land? Well, we are contemplating that because we have a good bit of land that we have accumulated over the year that's in the city limits or joining the city limits of some of these smaller towns that uh, that we have necessary that we we think that we ought to sell them because it uh, probably uh, demand is there and we ought to take that money and, and put in our reforestation and, and, and maybe other lands so it's, it's more urbanized urbanizing this more all the time we get more and more people to move in south georgia and north florida retiring from north and south of us and i think we're going to see more and more of that well, these sure. towns are getting bigger valdosta is a tremendous growth i talked to john about this yesterday <clears throat> about you must have been approached or been thought about selling the whole company to Warehouser or George Pacific or Union Camp at some time. 